Natural selection weeds out detrimental mutations and selects for beneficial mutations, but the neutral ones, having neither cost nor ill effect, may freely accumulate as junk. Beneficial mutations, if they exist at all, are absolutely rare. Any evolutionist will admit to this. Natural selection, natural selection is a fine-tuning process. It's a selection process. You can check out my debates for more on genetic entropy with some of the best evolutionary proponents out there. For example, I would recommend watching my debate with Dr. Stefan Frello, especially the portion, the discussion portion, where we actually do talk about neutral mutations and just mut mutation accumulation in general. Um, natural selection, it can remove the worst, most detrimental and deleterious mutations, and it can amplify the best beneficial mutations, let's say antibiotic resistance, for example, but it can do nothing. It can do nothing against those near neutral, low impact deleterious mutations. They accumulate like rust on a car. That's why the damage is largely invisible. And Aaron Ra here, it is clear that he doesn't understand mutations. He doesn't understand genetics as much as he may believe that he does. And the human mutation rate is alarmingly high. It's roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. What this actually means is that mutations, they're entering the human population at a rate much, much faster than natural selection could ever, ever possibly select away such mutations. It's like rust on a car. It's continuous end destruction. He believes that there are mutations that are absolutely neutral. And as I said earlier, as I said in my rebuttal to Godless Engineer, for example, that misunderstands the entire point at hand. Sure, it's neutral to the perspective of, of the organism's physical fitness or physical appearance, the phenotype, for example, but in no way can it be absolutely neutral to the genetic content or the genotype. These neutral mutations, the low impact near neutral mutations, the fact is, is that they have only a very tiny effect on fitness. It's like one single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia. Is one single spelling mistake going to have an overall effect that's negative in the long run to that book the size of an encyclopedia? No, but it's the buildup. It's the accumulation of them that in the long run degenerates destroys so essentially it comes down to the fact that harmful mutations they're essentially invisible absolutely invisible to the natural selection process nobody disagrees with natural selection nobody disagrees with a beneficial mutation here or there they're mostly reductive for example sickle cell anemia but at the end of the day no amount of rare beneficial mutations can counterbalance the information loss. The information loss based on the influx of near neutral deleterious mutations. So at the end of the day, this all indicates strongly that for one, the human genome and apparently all genomes must be accumulating harmful mutations continuously. And that such genomes, as I've stated before, they are slowly rusting out. And all of this has been verified. The inevitable genetic degeneration process, it's been validated by extensive numerical simulation experiments. And even in biological test systems, you can see these for yourselves. For example, Dr. John Sanford. Therefore, it all comes down to the fact that mutations are in raw here thinks that mutations are the creator, but they are the destroyer. They break things, they destroy. For example, bacteria, they can adapt, but what it is, it's adaptive degeneration. They lose genes short-term for adaptive purposes, but it's long-term degeneration. Mutations are destruction and not construction. Sorry, Aaron Ra.
about how, you know, mutations, a lot of them, they're not harmful, they're neutral, but that would misunderstand the entire point of, for one, genetic entropy, and two, you know, neutral mutations in general, because yes, most mutations are neutral from the perspective of the organism's physical fitness, right, the phenotype, of course, but all mutations must they must have effect on the genetic content, which is the genotype. So in no way are mutations truly neutral. Um, it all must have an effect on, on the genotype. In regards to his, um, you know, new information, beneficial mutations, the thing is a lot of them now, even if I gave him a couple, for example, it's still not going to counterbalance the damage. But a lot of it now is based on epigenetic markers and, and they're used and, and acted to control and regulate the activity of our genes right so our epigenome can influence our physical appearance in much the same way as our genes do but with no change to the underlying genetic code for example diet alters our teeth swimming alters our spleen size high altitude alters our you know chromosomes hard work alters our bones but the thing is there's no large scale evolution no new information is added just expressed we define a beneficial mutation as a mutation that provides a benefit to the organism in other words i'm now resistant to the antibiotic which is beneficial if that antibiotic's around you know? So if you look just at beneficial mutations, which is what evolutionists love to look at, beneficial, 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 and I say, but that's really irrelevant. What's happening at the genetic level? That's the key. It's not whether it's beneficial or not beneficial, it's what's happening genetically. And what we see, for example, with antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance comes by one of two ways, for the most part. You have a vector come into the organism, which is bringing in some kind of gene that makes it resistant, Okay, well, that vector already exists. You're not introducing anything new into biology. It already is there. So that doesn't account for the origin of anything. It just counts for how it moves around. Okay? The key thing then becomes mutations. That's why, that's why evolution is mutation and natural selection. Because if you do change the sequence, that has the potential to give you a whole new genetic component, a whole new genetic mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. But when we look at mutations that cause antibiotic resistance in bacteria, what they are is mutations that eliminate transport proteins, eliminate enzyme activities, eliminate functionality of certain proteins, eliminate, eliminate, reduce, cut down, eliminate. See, is there a trend here? No, okay. It's... With lactose utilization in a human, the reason I can drink milk is because the normal regulatory system that shuts down the gene that makes the enzyme so you can digest lactose, when you, reach when you move through puberty, that gene gets shut down. If you have the mutation, that blocks the shutting down. But what have you done? What you've done is you've eliminated a pre-existing system. Mm -hmm. Another example of new variants is the glycophorin A somatic cell mutation, which has been identified in some Tibetans, which allows them to endure prolonged periods at altitudes over 7,000 feet without succumbing to apoplexia or altitude sickness. Well, basically, epigenetic inheritance is this uh, new unconventional way of looking at genetics. Up until now, a mutation was considered the only thing that could be either positive or negative in regards to fitness, because without mutations, evolution can occur. So this is where epigenetic comes from, and it throws, it goes against basically the idea that uh, inheritance only happens through genetic mutations or the DNA code passes on to the parent from offspring. This means that a parent's experiences in the form of epigenetic tags can be passed down to future generations. So epigenetics is the study of where factors influence a gene and how and when the gene is expressed regarding like the Sherpas of the high altitude people of the Nepal. Uh, the mainstream thought is that a single one point mutation led to a better adaptation for the high altitudes of the Tibetan people. But modern science has revealed that the epigenetic mechanisms are also behind this adaptation. It's not a beneficial mutation. You can read a peer review paper on this, um, on the epigenetic signatures of the high altitude adaptation of the Tibetan population. If you think about it like twins, uh, twins have identical DNA. And uh, think about it like one person turns 50 years old and so does the other one, right? But one will have cancer or heart disease, the other uh, might not. One will go bald or be bipolar or start to lose their eyesight where the other doesn't. This is because of epigenetics. It's not inherited genetic mutations like we're told. Um, uh, take, for example, the uh, epigenome, which keeps a long life communication between environment and our genes that, that turn on and off tumor suppressing proteins. This is a reason why one twin will get cancer and the other will not, because epigenetic changes via the individual diet or environment will 
it'll cause this. So when you hear about beneficial genetic mutations, you are actually hearing about epigenetic regulation, not beneficial mutations. This is why the Sherpa people who have, uh, you know, been called beneficial muta mutations that allow them to thrive at this high altitude. Yet when they relocate and have children, they pass on none of these beneficial mutations, so-called, for these high altitudes because they have no genetic requirement for living at such altitudes. So again, it was never a beneficial mutation. It was uh, already present in the gene that got switched on. Evidence shown in that it's nurture over nature. So to make matters worse for evolutionary theory, epigenetic modifications themselves are actually often resulted in DNA errors. And this leads to gradual but inevitable DNA degradation as well. So epigenetic adaptation will never result in any kind of evolution because epigenetic mechanisms only regulate pre-existing biological information. Since epigenetics is not mutation-based and there is no actual proof for beneficial mutations anymore of all these things that we're talking about, like the, like the lactose mutation, they claim that it was a single SNP, a single point mutation resulting in the lactose uh, persistence, but that's wrong. It's epigenetics like all the rest. Um, they, it's actually a methylation level, uh, MCM6 and LCT genes. So as far as the more they look into the epigenetics, the more that they find that it's that relation and it's not a mutation at all. And then there's a family in Connecticut who've been identified as having hyperdense, virtually unbreakable bones. Fail again. This has nothing to do with beneficial mutations. This is just epigenetic regulation. PCR5 Delta 32 mutation. About 10% of whites of European origin now carry it, but the incidence is only 2% in Central Asia and it is completely absent among East Asians, Africans, and tribal Americans. It appears to have suddenly become relatively common among white Europeans about 700 years ago, evidently as a result of the Black Plague, indicating another example of natural selection allowing one gene dominance in a changing environment. It is harmless or neutral in every respect other than its one clearly beneficial feature. According to ScienceFrontiers.com, if one inherits this gene from both parents, they will be especially resistant, if not immune, to AIDS. There are people that are actually resistant to HIV. Do you know how they're resistant to HIV? They are missing the key protein the HIV virus binds to. And if the virus can't bind, it can't infect. Now, if you're exposed to HIV, that'd be a pretty beneficial mutation, right? Sure. But what's it caused by? It's caused by loss of a pre-existing protein. And so what we see, and I can go on and on, what we see is repeatedly what the evolutionist community does is they offer example after example after example of what they claim, here's how evolution works. No, it's not. Because what you're doing is you're taking pre-existing systems and knocking them out or reducing them. You're not explaining how they evolved to begin with. It's the analogy of if you have a house and in your house you have the dining room and a wall and then your recreation room. And your wife being, you know, the big socialite that she is, she wants a bigger dining room to entertain her parties. Well, you have a choice. I can keep my rec room or I can knock at that wall and get a bigger dining room. Well, you know, everybody knows happy wife is a happy home. So you knock out the inner wall and they have a bigger dining room. And it's beneficial because she's happy. But don't tell a carpenter that how you built the house was by knocking out a wall. But that's what evolutionists do repeatedly is they give you an illustration of knocking out a wall and this is how the house was built. Genetic evidence is so reliable it can get a life or death sentence even without need of other types of evidence to corroborate it. So the unique fingerprints of mutation and molecular phylogeny are not only profound evidence of evolution, they amount to legal proof of it. <laughs> evolution of life is analogous to the evolution of language. Oh good, I'm glad you think so, because language actually proves creation and completely falsifies evolution. If you don't think so, you're completely insane, and you should prove me wrong by debunking the video I made. It's only 10 minutes. I think you can make time for it, but I don't expect an answer. So you said, Hovind would have to concede that evolution is not a religion. I'm at the 1 minute, 3 second mark of your 18 minute closing commentary. Took me an hour to take care of 1 minute, Mr. Nelson. Evolution is a religion. I'm not going to concede. I will never concede that it's not a religion because it is a religion. You guys believe these things are related. You believe it very strongly. Will you ever concede that the first five meanings of the word are a religion? You're the one that needs to concede. You don't accept evolution. You believe in evolution. You kids got to watch them to use that word accept. You accept evolution. That's, they're sneaking it in on you. Don't use the word accept. You believe. 
You do believe, I'm sure, but it's a religion. Mr. Nelson is very verbose. We just covered one minute of his closing comments. I'm not in a hurry to cover all 18 minutes, but I will, as needed, when I feel like it. You are low priority in my book. You have what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, Mr. Nelson. You think you know a whole lot more than you really know. There's nothing to cry about, okay? I can shut you up. I challenge you. You might want to warn your wife. You're irrational. Good, shut up. <laughs> okay. Wow. Correct your idiocy. I should have known better. Kind of like a mosquito. You gotta just once in a while. You gotta swat them. Is there no one else? Is there no one else? Who are you, soldier? Call me anytime. Eight five five Big Dino Extension Three. I'll be glad to explain it to you.